Well, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, on behalf of the steering committee that has organized this event, and with a special nod of appreciation to the Barber Center, uh, to our postdoctoral fellow, Hallie Marshall, as, who's assisted us, and to the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, uh, which is hosting a reception afterwards to which you are all welcome to attend, 5 to 6.30. It would have been here, but because it's intercession, uh, this building, or this part of the building anyway, closes at 5. Um, but I would like to welcome you to the first of what is going to be a series of conversations over the next 12 months or so to discuss the role of the creative arts and humanities at UBC. This represents the first public phase of a period of consultation to consider the advantages and the challenges of creating an institute or center whose goal would be to increase mutual collaboration between in, uh, institutes uh, at the university, between departments, between individuals, between faculties, as well as the local communities that comprise the multicultural mosaic of Vancouver. The committee has been called, that has been called to explore this idea, has in its preliminary de deliberations emphasized the importance of, uh, of talking and, and seeking the advice and opinions from the widest swath of possible constituencies and is in absolute agreement that without equally wide support across the interested units within this university um, that this attempt at synergy, collaboration, and engagement will, put simply, not succeed. Our aim ultimately is to pre uh, present a detailed feasibility study for a future institute, including comparisons with other similar venues across North America and beyond, and with the distinctive conditions of UBC clearly um, in mind. Other centers and institutes with similar ambitions exist at other universities in North America and elsewhere. And these centers have sponsored such projects as joint graduate seminars across the disciplines and theme semesters where undergraduate students can choose from faculty course offerings conceived to address contemporary issues from multiple perspectives. These topics have been as broad as water and as specific as the role of museums at universities. Imagine at UBC a theme um, such as repatriation and recovery, bringing together conservation biologists from the B uh, Beatty Di Biodiversity Museum, art historians from the Belkin Gallery, anthropologists and curators from the Museum of Anthropology, and scholars from the disciplines of geography, environmental sciences, literature, history, art, and music. This is the kind of multi-dimensional approach which might include lectures by prominent public intellectuals and First Nations leaders to which the broader public would of course be invited as well. We have the resources already to do this at UBC. Indeed, many such events are already taking place here. It's merely a question of coordinating our efforts better for the benefit of the university um, community. One final word about nomenclature. The idea of the humanities that we're working with is a placeholder rather than a fixed definition. This is not an institute meant to build a shrine to Aristotle or to reignite the canon debates of the 1980s, although a shrine to Aristotle wouldn't look bad uh, where that tower is right now, but uh, that's another issue. Um, we can also look to other institutes in Canada and elsewhere whose intriguing titles already allow us to imagine other possibilities. McGill University's Institute for the Public Life of Arts and Ideas, for instance, evokes a kind of civic engagement that I think would serve a much needed purpose in Vancouver and at UBC in a mutually beneficial way. A center for the global humanities also seems appropriate to who we are and what we as a community espouse most forcefully and most eloquently. Um, finally, um, I, I, I'd like to um, thank the two units on behalf of the steering committee who have sponsored the exploratory phase of this initiative. The Office of the Vice President Research and International and the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, now under the direction of Gage Averill, whom I have the privilege of introducing today on behalf of the committee. All of us know Gage as Dean, but many of us also recognize in him an exceptional scholar of the global arts and humanities, a prime exemplar of the creative and inspirational scholarship that can emerge when arts and humanities come together. His ethnomusicological work from Haitian folk song to barbershop quartet 
from liner notes author to master of the hydrolophone, hopefully he'll perform for us later this afternoon, has earned him many awards and honors. <clears throat> but from, what our, from our perspective, what's most valuable is his connections to, between popular culture and the academy, his ability to use academic scholarship to enhance our understanding of music and world cultures. So please join me in welcoming him, who will offer some opening comments and introduce our afternoon speakers. And thanks again for participating in this conversation, and I hope future conversations to come. And please come to the reception from 5 to 6.30 at the Wall Center. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, and thanks, uh, everyone. I don't think I've ever been called a prime exemplar of anything before, uh, positive or negative, but uh, I'm happy uh, to have been so called today. Uh, I had, uh, for all of us, we, we end up uh, encountering angels as, as we pass through uh, our lives. One of those for me was um, the Mellon Fellowships in the Humanities, Mellon Foundation, when as a graduate student rather recently minted from forestry, a dropout uh, uh, who had passed through a forestry school, uh, try, trying to enter graduate school in the humanities. Uh, they took a risk on me. Um, I remember this experience of meeting uh, uh, extraordinary scholars in the humanities around a table, an interview. Um, and it was that first event, there was a conference of Mellon Fellows the first few cohorts in this group, uh, that exposed me to the kind of interdisciplinary, uh, generous conversation that can be had in the humanities and that open up doors, doors that continue to uh, allow me to pass through through uh, much of my career. Uh, I was uh, hugely indebted uh, to that. I think I remember the conversation on the first day of that, of that, um, uh, that event. It was, what is the master discipline? And of course, our philosophers there were quite certain which direction this was going to go. I think I remember uh, raising my hand and, and, uh, and entering anthropology as, the, um, as my answer uh, to that question, which is probably not the thing to do at a humanities uh, gathering, if just, just a point in case you're curious. Um, I think I still believe that, but that's another. I'm, I am, as, as so those of you who know me know, uh, a humanist of the arts with uh, a, few, um, a few of my feet stuck rather uh, firmly in the methods and methodologies of, of the uh, social sciences. So that, that did make sense for me. Uh, I went from um, graduate school into my first real job at, the, uh, at Wesleyan University after Columbia, um, where in my second year I was, um, I applied and was accepted as a fellow in the Wesleyan Center for the Humanities, uh, a wonderful institute in such a small university. Uh, West End is 3,000 strong students, strong, mostly undergraduates. And there, uh, Richard Oman, who was guiding the uh, year, um, uh, and six or seven of us created a group studying um, popular culture. And this was about 1990, and we, uh, we began a series, 91, we had a series of interviews with uh, cultural interlocutors. Um, we brought people who had, who were running sports centers, who were uh, directing uh, national public radio, who were making ads for MTV, on and on. It's a very, very interesting group of, um, of um, uh, folks from industry and the media, and we produced a book called Making and Selling Culture, um, which captured some of the questions we were asking. One of those was simply, how powerful are you? It was quite commonly understood among scholars in the public that those who were directing cultural industries were in, in essence shaping those industries for the rest of us to consume. Uh, whereas we found that most of those felt in, entirely trapped by public opinion, public needs, public experiences, and uh, uh, with very little um, uh, ability to, uh, to truly innovate. So we asked these questions of, and uh, directed that into a product. And again, this, uh, this experience was quite formative for me. It, it, it helped to um, maneuver my initial uh, research uh, questions, the work I'd done on a dissertation, in a new direction, and uh, exposed me to a group of, of scholars, some of whom I keep in, in touch with all over North America, 
and beyond, um, and gave a chance to sit outside my, my discipline of ethnomusicology in a department of music um, for a really vigorous exchange of ideas and, and beliefs. Extraordinary time. Um, so I've had a few of these experiences. I helped, uh, I was involved in, in starting the uh, Jackman Humanities Institute at the uh, University of Toronto. Um, does anyone ever watch the um, show about Saskatchewan called, so now off television, called uh, Corner Gas? Do you know what they do when they mention the town next door in Corner Gas? They always go, and spit to the side. I know that happens when one mentions the University of Toronto here, but the, um, um, I, did, I was thinking that would be inappropriate at this um, venue. But the, uh, uh, it's not that I would love to see us import any of these models to the, um, uh, to the University of British Columbia. Um, but I do think they served me and my colleagues very well uh, in different ways at those different institutions. Um, the session today is entitled, Where Do Humanities Go From Here? And that's a conscious allusion to the university's campaign to brand uh, UBC as a place of mind. Uh, and so the, um, the, the phrase, from here, uh, appears in various places around, around campus, on banners, on websites, in videos that you may have seen. Uh, it's rather, it's a teaser, from here. Um, but it's plastered about our uh, environs. The question we're, uh, that we're raising today revolves not around us creating a new sense of pride in the humanities, uh, or certainly not making propaganda for the humanities, UBC, but rather it involves taking seriously the role of humanities from here. So I'm not, I'm hoping that we don't create a Jackman Institute for the Humanities or a Wesleyan Institute for the Humanities, but that we think about what that means from here at uh, UBC Think about what defines us, think about the questions that we raise, the, the uh, priorities that we stress in the, in the plan, place and promise, and, um, and determine um, a direction that would be unique and inspiring for UBC. What would it mean to have a center for the humanities on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam First Nation Indian Band? What would it mean to um, have humanities from here, looking out on from uh, Point Grey to the Pacific to the Pac Rim nations um, and our engagement in Asia and the Pacific? We do note, note in our Place and Promise plan uh, priority of community engagement and communities writ large. I think you discussed this in your, in your paper, Kathleen. Um, but our, our community is both the, our local community, but also the national community and international community and our engagement with the globe. Um, so it is something closer to the, the public that uh, Kathleen has raised in her, um, in her article. What would it mean to, uh, to take uh, uh, a look at the humanities at a university where nearly 40% of our undergraduate students speak a language at home other than English? And by and large, I'm not speaking of French for our American colleagues. <clears throat> How can the creative arts work together with the humanities to foster better civic engagement in Vancouver uh, and more connections between Vancouver and the university? These are some of the questions that we might raise as we think about this notion of from here and what it means for our institute in the humanities. Should we decide to create one? We're fortunate to have here with us today two scholars who have dedicated much of their careers to asking these kinds of questions. And uh, we look forward to engaging with them this afternoon and tomorrow when we'll hold consultative meetings at St. John's College. And should you want to know more about those consultative meetings, today's our sort of public uh, discussion, please talk to Neil and um, he'll um, uh, direct you to those discussions. Also wanted to say, uh, just to, to note that of course when you when you raise a question like this, when you raise an idea like this, uh, it certainly engenders questions throughout the university about what we're doing, where we're going, how much of this is predetermined. Um, already, the embed this event today has generated considerable enthusiasm as, as well as well, some concern um, about a, you, you, you name it, how are we defining, defining the creative arts and humanities? Um, let's see, we, we aren't yet, just to answer that question. 
Uh, what's the scope of the institution's ambitions? We don't know. Uh, you see, I have really good answers for these questions. Uh, we don't know because, in fact, the, this discussions today, uh, the consultations tomorrow, and similar events next fall will help us to, uh, to determine that, and this is a legitimate area of, um, of uh, discussion throughout the process. Uh, questions have been raised about the scope of the institution's um, ambition, as I noticed, um, and about the, the resources that would be required to bring it into existence. Um, I do steward some resources here. We haven't yet, other than this initial phase, uh, we haven't um, dedicated them. We are certainly moving into a period in which we will be doing some fundraising. I will say nothing more about that since it's all secret. Uh, but this, uh, should you uh, determine that this is a, um, an area that you would like to explore at the university, uh, this is certainly uh, an area that we could do some very vigorous and, um, uh, I think, productive fundraising. Um, you know, at the same time, I've heard from, in my first seven years here, from faculty um, um, about the problems they face in a kind of da their daily life and the humanities of this institution, the, the difficulty of communicating with colleagues across uh, across departmental and, and program um, boundaries, the interest in the clearinghouse for information, uh, there's an interest in, in um, uh, bringing, um, in sp spiking internal activities and bringing in external visitors, uh, to encouraging cross-disciplinary teaching and scholarship. All of this uh, could, be, could be at least partially addressed in the, uh, the work that you do coming out of, out of these, um, these events. So I would like to get on to introducing our speakers um, they, um, uh, they have taken their time, their very uh, precious time out, to be with us, and we're deeply grateful. Our first speaker is Jeff Harpin. He's the president and director of the National Humanities Center, Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, uh, which is the only institute for advanced study in the world dedicated exclusively to the humanities. And I should note, as you all know, we have the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies here at the UBC. And one of the questions we'd love to, to deal with is how we articulate our interests in the Humanities Institute with, the, with existing units at um, UBC, and especially with Peter Wall, um, whether that's a very closely linked um, set of institutions and in working in tandem, uh, you will uh, be better able to uh, determine. Uh, professor Harpin is also visiting research professor of English at Duke University and at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's trained as a literary scholar, but his work has encompassed a wide range of topics and fields. His long-standing scholarly interests include the role of ethics in literary study, the place of language in intellectual history, and the work of Joseph Conrad. In recent years, he's become a prominent historian of and an advocate for the humanities. Uh, earlier this year, the humanities and the dream of America appeared from the University of Chicago Press. It addresses, among other things, the relevance of humanistic inquiry in a wide range of fields and forums. Uh, he's also discussed the need to engage a broader public, very much a part of our discussion today. He has received fellowships from the J.S. Guggenheim Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and under his leadership, the National Humanities Center has sponsored initiatives that have encouraged dialogue between the humanities and the natural and social sciences as well. I'm delighted to uh, bring up to the podium uh, Professor Jeff Harpin. Thanks, Gage, and thanks, Neil, and thank you all for coming. This is my first visit to Vancouver, and it's such a beautiful campus. As we were walking over here to the building, I said, gee, if it weren't raining today, this would be the perfect day to be on this campus. And I was told very severely that in Vancouver terms, this did not qualify as precipitation. <laughs> so, <laughs> but still a very beautiful campus. And it's exciting, of course, to be present at the beginning of anything. I can already say after only uh, a few hours on campus that whatever you decide to do here, you do have the intellectual and the cultural resources to do it with. I'm going to begin by taking up uh, in a very literal and even plotting way the question of where do we go from here, which seems uh, a question that, that's uh, truly good for all seasons. First of all, I think that we have to understand where we are and how we got here. And uh, if you're a humanist, uh, you're uh, long accustomed to, to thinking 
that uh, uh, wherever we are is not necessarily where we want to go. But if we're going to go anywhere, I think it's important to understand how we got to where we are right now. Now, you can approach this question from many directions, and I'm going to begin by taking one that might seem like a side angle, but it's not. It really speaks to the essence of it. Uh, there is a tension within the humanities between teaching and research, and this is distinctive to the field of the humanities. The social sciences, the natural sciences, mathematics does not experience this tension. Uh, science, after all, is all research, <coughs> but the humanities are research and they are something other than research and the, uh, the kind of friction between them creates a constant problem that uh, we have not yet figured out how to address. And I think if you're going to have a humanities institute, especially one that is uh, uh, associated with uh, an institute for advanced study, you're going to have to find some way to uh, address this. Uh, and if we understand why there is a tension between teaching and research in the humanities, then I think that this will lead to an understanding of how people think about the humanities, including how scholars think about the humanities. It's not always uh, apparent to me that humanistic scholars really understand what they're doing or why they're doing it in that particular way. And so a little bit of history might be, might be useful. I'm going to begin with a, uh, by referring to a, 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 a series of articles made by a guy named Mark Bauerlein, who is writing in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, Mark Bauerlein's uh, research was sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute, and so you might be tempted to think that it takes a politically conservative tack, and perhaps it does, but the, the, the focus of these articles uh, was that there is too much research going on in the humanities today. Uh, research is a waste and a distraction. Research is beside the point. It is not the main thing. In fact, it, it, uh, it, it dilutes, it compromises, it even negates what we might be doing that is really useful and valuable, which is <coughs> teaching people about big ideas, and these words are capitalized, of course, about big ideas or moral cruxes or exposing them to monuments of great art, uh, verbal beauty uh, and accomplishment, the, uh, the uh, I think, the museum approach to culture edifying people, enriching them, ennobling them, uh, deepening their experience. Uh, Bauerlein has actually said in an interview that he thought that there should be uh, only a few research universities in the world, 20 or 25 I think was his number. I'm presuming that uh, the university that he teaches at Emory would be among those 20 or 25 and that he personally would be given an exemption to continue to pursue research uh, if, if this were put into place. <coughs> He uh, had some database that showed that 16,771 books on Shakespeare had been produced in a, in a particular time. And he said, really, this is ridiculous. It's uh, 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 reached a point of diminishing returns, uh, and, and we should simply cease, uh, because uh, teaching and research were a zero-sum game, and any moment that a professor devoted to research would be stolen from the students who so richly deserved it, who in fact were paying for it. Now, I'm sympathetic with this argument in many respects. I think that humanists should teach, they should teach well, but I don't think that it is a zero-sum game, and I do think definitely that there is a productive relationship between the teaching and the research part of humanistic work. Uh, the way to understand an argument like Bauerlein, and he is very, very far from being a lone voice in the wilderness on this. He is, in fact, part of a chorus. Uh, but the way to understand it is by uh, returning to a certain strand in the classical tradition that he takes very much to heart, whether he knows it or not. This is a tradition associated with Isocrates, uh, who uh, at the time in uh, Athens and for many, many, many hundreds of years thereafter, uh, was the uh, leading voice in forming the ideas about education that came, in and came out of the classical world. In the school of Isocrates, the emphasis was on memorizing vast tracts of Homer and other models of prose because these were not only verbally beautiful, uh, they represented the height of the rhetorical achievement of the ancient world, but also they gave you moral exempla that were, were very edifying. <coughs> and uh, the school of Isocrates was actually a more recognizable school than any other in, uh, uh, in the classical world at the time and that there were students who enrolled and they paid tuition. <laughs> Uh, and at the end, they were uh, given not a diploma, but they were thought to be certified. And these, this, the, the, this kind of education was the way the classical world reproduced its leadership class, because it was all about leadership. 
uh, <coughs> and uh, when the Roman Empire took over this tradition, they favored the tradition of the, the school of Isocrates over the school of Socrates, which we now think of as the essence of the classical tradition, because the empire did not need people wandering around scratching their heads on an endless quest for truth. They needed people who could run an empire. And the Isocratic tradition was much more useful in giving people positive knowledge, precepts to live by, truths that, that remain true, than the school of Isocrates, which was constantly skeptical, questioning, uh, interrogating received opinion, ironic, uh, indirect, incomplete, and unfinished. Isocrates was exactly the opposite. Uh, <coughs> now, it's clear that we still retain some remnants of the tradition associated with Isocrates. Anytime an administrator, a dean, a president, or a parent perhaps, uh, talks about the university as the site where moral citizenship is inculcated, they are speaking the language of Isocrates. Uh, and any time that somebody talks about the university as a place where students are exposed to the examined life, uh, the probing critique of, uh, of, of prevailing doxa, they are speaking the language of Socrates. Now, <clears throat> in the modern universities, these have crystallized in, in various ways. I, Socrates is actually associated with a powerful, I won't say dominant, but a very powerful strain of the humanities. This is where people encounter images of mastery and wisdom, truth and beauty. And Socrates, the idea of the endless quest, is associated actually more directly with philosophy and with science. It's interesting to think of Socrates as the father of science, but that is actually, I believe, the way it is played out. Now, these traditions merged in a new way at the end of the Second World War in American higher education, when through the agency of a couple of books, influential commission reports, uh, government policy statements, uh, a new template for American education emerged. It was to be uh, a, 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 a program of liberal education that included a significant exposure to the natural sciences, the social sciences, and at the moral core, the humanities. The humanities represented in this tripartite conception the continuation of the Isocratic tradition. The humanities was where you would receive uh, the, uh, the kind of moral grounding that would stand you in good stead for here and ever after. And the sciences is where you pursued the quest of Socrates, uh, an endless quest for an ultimately unfinishable truth. <clears throat> the humanities was the core of a system of education that in, this is the really radical innovation, and I think today it is, stands as the greatest American invention of the 20th century a system of mass liberal education that would regulate the organization of education from the high school level on up to the Ivy Leagues. That is, every American in this emergent plan after the Second World War would be educated in roughly the same way. And the idea was that this would create a massive engine of social dynamism and mobility because the children of immigrants and slaves and people of ethnic or religious minorities would receive essentially the same kind of education that people of a much, uh, much higher uh, level of, uh, of a social uh, position would receive, albeit at a higher price at their more expensive in, uh, institutions. And <coughs> this, I think, produced the system of mass liberal education, uh, produced fabulous economic and educational and social benefits for the United States, at least, for almost half a century after the Second World War, the period from 1945 to 1975 or so is commonly referred to as the golden age of higher education. Now, <clears throat> you can see that, the, that there's a certain allocation here. The humanities are associated with wisdom, and the sciences are associated with knowledge. <laughs> uh, or they're, they're both associated with truth, but they reach truth by a different direction. One is kind of timeless, eternal, difficult to describe exactly, and the other is very precise, very, um, very empirical. Uh, now, what complicated this picture was the emergence at the same time, at the end of the Second World War, of research as the overriding imperative of the university. Uh, this was propelled by the 
formation of the National Institutes for Health and the National Science Foundation. Uh, this sounds very boring, I know, but in fact, it's, it's incredibly crucial to the way education developed. Uh, after 1950, these two federal agencies began to pour immense amounts of money into the system of higher education. And they had the effect of reorienting universities and even baccalaureate colleges as time went by into engines of research. They used to be engines of education, but they became over time engines of research. Uh, uh, the, the sciences uh, simply had to devote themselves to getting, getting government grants if they were to exist at all. And today in the United States, uh, uh, if you are a scientist, uh, you basically sign on not to a tenured position, but you get the opportunity to earn your own salary through your grant getting activities. And the universities today justify their scientific enterprises by the amount of money that they bring in. And in fact, science itself is justified as a grant getting operation. It's associated with technology, with innovation, with health, with well-being, and that is the justification for science today. Science used to be justified as the purest of intellectual pursuits. It had no immediate utility. It had no end in sight. It was curiosity for the sake of curiosity alone. But that is no longer the case. Now science is devoted. Now science is a profit center within the university. Just in order to breathe this new air, the humanities, which were set up as the site of wisdom, uh, had themselves to become research enterprises. Uh, now, research is a professional activity. It's undertaken by people who speak largely to themselves. They cultivate exotica. Uh, they they, they uh, ponder questions that are kind of at the far reaches of inquiry. They speak a language that is not spoken by other people. Research is not a vernacular undertaking. Research is a professional undertaking. Uh, and as time went by, the humanities themselves became professionalized, they became elitist, they became obscurantist. Uh, uh, <coughs> and in the sciences, this is not a problem. After all, you're impressed with your son or daughter when they uh, have written a paper, not no two consecutive words of which you understand, if it's in a scientific field. But it is a problem when it comes to the humanities, because the humanities, we have been acculturated and accustomed to think, is a vernacular undertaking. It speaks to all people. It speaks in the vernacular. It speaks our language. Uh, but you can see that with all the professional incentives in a university tending towards research, you have a problem in the humanities. Because the more professors advance professionally in their field, the weaker is their connection to public understanding and support. Because they're no longer interested in, in, in the isocratic tradition. Uh, <coughs> the humanities have really been tormented by this, this difficulty. Uh, research requires funding. In order to get funded, you have to make a research proposal which justifies what you do, which gives a monetary value to what you do. Uh, and this, this value must be justified by, by casting your work in very, very uh, limited, specific, and technical terms uh, that most people cannot understand. And so the result is what we have today. The humanities riven between two projects. One is dedicated to ennoblement, enlargement of the mind, cultivation of the imagination. And this is centered or localized in the undergraduate programs in the humanities. And then at the graduate level, we have the Socratic orientation, research, progressive knowledge, uh, and specialization. Uh. <coughs> so to rephrase the original question, where do we go from here? Well, I think we have to begin by reminding ourselves that as humanists, we do two very essential things. The first thing is that we teach undergraduates. We expose them to things that they have probably never been exposed to before and may well never be exposed to again. Hopefully, we teach well. And there are opportunities available to teachers in the humanities that are not available to teachers in other disciplines to influence lives, to transform people's experience. Uh, uh, you're, if you, um, 
Come out of a college education and you remember it fondly. If you're like most people, what you remember is that time when a teacher looked you in the eye and said, what do you think? In other words, what is your opinion about what you think? I spoke uh, uh, last week uh, to a man who had educated in Cuba. Uh, and he said he came to this country at uh, the age of 20 and he was thrown into college. He spoke very little English. He was picking it up day by day. And he was in a class on Shakespeare. Uh, this is the immersion therapy program of, uh, of education. And uh, four or five weeks into the class, uh, his teacher focused on the scene in Macbeth where the three witches were doubling, doubling, toiling, and troubling, and said, what do you think? And he knew enough English to understand the question, but he said, literally, nobody had ever asked me that before. <laughs> uh, these are transformational moments. We take them for granted in our system, but we should not because these are the things that reach deep into the soul of a young person and change them forever. And they are available to people who work in the humanities, not so much if you're teaching differential equations or statistics. We expose people to works of great power, imaginative beauty, and this is our forte. We have this, this is ours. The second thing that we do and must never forget that we do, is we have an absolutely immense research assignment. We have total responsibility for everything that everybody knows about everything that happened before last night to us. <clears throat> uh, everything that you know about anything was discovered and verified and publicized by some scholar or other. There is no other way. Uh, we must never forget that this is our charge, this is our burden, and this is our golden opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> if there were no research component to the humanities, or if that research component was segregated so that only a couple of universities uh, could engage in research, imagine the vast difference that would result at those universities where no research was conducted. Uh, the past might still be conveyed but it would be conveyed in the form of doctrine or, or myth or a set of museum exhibits. It would be conveyed passively, received passively and probably resentfully. But when the teacher, the transformational teacher who can look you in the eye and say, what do you think about this, is also a scholar along with the information, something else altogether is conveyed as well. That is a spirit of activism, a spirit of mattering, a spirit of uh, creativity. The past is no longer received as a bolus, but as something to be inquired into. The past is open. The past is something yet to be discovered. The past is something even yet to be created. And if you have an open past, you have an open future, a closed past, and really you have a closed future. So let me conclude with a couple of recommendations that are perhaps less philosophical and hortatory and more practical uh, for anybody attempting to uh, go from here to there. My first recommendation, born of many years of experience, is that collective action is more powerful than individual action. Uh, it's common, especially uh, common in a research university, but it's especially common, I think, among humanists who are typically lone wolves and solitary agents, to think of themselves as independent contractors whom the university is very fortunate to employ, but whose loyalties are really to their own career or maybe to their discipline, but not necessarily to the university with whom they have a contingent relationship. They send me checks from time to time, but basically my time is my own. This is an unproductive attitude, collective action, at the department level, at the discipline level, at the college level, is always more important or more effective than, than individual action. And uh, I think that team players ought to be recognized and rewarding. Uh, after all, teams can have uh, Michael Jordans on them, they can have Wayne Gretzky's on them, uh, but the team wins. The second recommendation is to pay attention to the strengths of the humanities. They are, once again, to teach and teach well, really well, and also to deliver the past in a way that makes a difference to the present through their research. Uh, 
what the humanities really have that other disciplines do not have is pleasure. They can inspire, they can augment, they can create pleasure. Think of pleasure as a mighty river, irresistible. You can channel it for a while, but it will break through your levees. Uh, if, you can, if you can get pleasure on your side uh, and get other people to understand this, uh, you will not be denied anything that, you, anything that you wish. I think that humanists should maximize pleasure at the undergraduate level, deep, rich, interesting, complicated pleasure, and at the graduate level they should teach a discipline, a discipline that commands respect in the world of research. Uh, too often, I think, uh, uh, we neglect either the promulgation of pleasure or the necessity of having and teaching a discipline. I think the key principle is that in any, any initiative, everybody has to pull their weight. And by he, this I mean everybody has to pull their weight. Not just the people who are pulling their weight have to pull their weight, but the others who might pull their weight, but, are, but typically don't pull their weight. They too have to pull their weight. They have to teach and teach well. They have to serve the community and the department, and they have to do research which gets you respect. The balance between teaching service and research will be worked out perhaps in different proportions or different weights at place by place. That's for you to decide. But everybody should do everything so that there are no outliers. There are no people who have established a reputation as being simply too feckless to trust with any kind of responsibility and so escape responsibility on that basis. So if we're asking where we go from here, I think we should begin, I mean, this question is up to you to decide where we go from here, but I think that it would be useful if we began by understanding that there is a we involved, and there is a here involved, and lastly, that there is a necessity to go somewhere. Thanks. Thank uh, Jeff for those those comments and uh, learned a lot from them. First of all, I love the. Um, I'm not responding here officially. We're just getting the PowerPoint up for the second speaker. Um, I love this the uh, contrast set between the Isocratic and Socratic um, uh, approaches that that worked its way through the um, through the, the paper. And I also learned that it's possible to send checks only occasionally to, um, uh, to the uh, uh, independent contractors who constitute my faculty. That's a brilliant idea. I'll have to work on that. Um, I have to expose myself as a dean every once in a while, right? Let's, I have to go to the dark side. Our, uh, our second speaker is Kathy Woodward. And um, I was remembering uh, speaking with Kathy right before um, we got up today that I was, I was told I had to meet her uh, by Bob Gibbs, a colleague of mine at the University of Toronto, who is the head of the, the director of that uh, center that I spoke about, the Institute U of T. Um, she is at uh, my alma mater, the University of Washington, where she directs the Simpson Center for the Humanities. Prior to arriving in the Pacific Northwest, she was director of the Center for 20, 20th Century Studies, that's that former century, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where she also taught in the Department of English and the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Modern Studies. Uh, she's received grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. In her current post, she has spearheaded projects on the digital humanities, which she established as a key initiative at the Simpson Center in 2005, uh, and also on the importance of public scholarship, about which she has published an article in the journal Daedalus from 2009, entitled The Future of Humanities in the Present and in the Public. Uh, that was the article to which I referred rather obliquely in my comments uh, before, and I, which I believe many of you have read in preparation, preparation for today's discussion. She's also the author of Statistical Panic, The Cultural Poetics, uh, excuse me, The Cultural Politics and Poetics of the Emotions, and she's editor of The Myth of Information, Technology and Post-Industrial Culture. She serves on the steering committee of the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Advanced Collaboratory. You'll note that I, uh, I skipped the acronym for that. Um, and the, uh, Hastack, I believe. Haystack. Uh, Haystack. 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 Of course. Excuse me. It's actually a clever acronym. Uh, and the International Advisory Board of the Consortium of Humanity Centers and Institutes, an institution of which she was president from 1995 to 2001. 
uh, coming to us directly uh, from our sister institution south of the border. Um, Kathleen Wilbur, nice to have you here. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me. The institution that is the Humanities Center is an institution I dearly love. I have never left it, actually, as John Beasley Murray knows. I was at Milwaukee for many years directing their center and then moved to Washington to do the same thing. So I'm thrilled that you're going to, I assume you're going to, establish a Humanities Center. And while I'll be making some general remarks, I also want to make a few logistical remarks about Humanities Centers along the way. Uh, thanks again to Neil and to Gage. We live in a time, you've already um, heard this today, of immense change. It's driven in great part by the co-evolution of globalization on the one hand and the communications revolution on the other, referred to as new media, referred to as digital humanities, and we need to change as a result. It's a time for action. You're ready to go somewhere. I call that scholarship in action, and I call that scholarship in public. Many of you have read what's happening in the United States. We're questioning higher education and its institutions on matters of affordability, accessibility, and most importantly for many of us, and this is something that Jeffrey alluded to in his remarks, on the matter of our aloofness from public concerns. In the US, there's a widespread decline in confidence in what we do. There's no question about that and many refer to the alienating effects of precisely what you referred to, Jeffrey, as professionalization and specialization. It has reached the tipping point in the United States where higher education is now, and this has been subjected to data-driven research. Most people in the US now consider higher education a private good and not a public good at all. I know there's a similar story, a similar story, you're not at that point in Canada, thank goodness. But what this means, of course, in the United States is that tuition is going up and up. The amount of money for public institutions uh, from the state is going down, and this will just proliferate and exacerbate and create further and worse feedback loops. It's clear that it's up to us to make absolutely visible what the importance is of our work to a more general publish, uh, public. We're doing fresh work, many of us, and we want to be able to connect that work and show how it's important for the public good and that it is a public good in and of itself. I'm thinking of Jeff now when I um, remind those of us in the US that in fact, for Thomas Jefferson, the legacy was not just the Declaration of Independence, but it was a university, the University of Virginia, very important. With the emergence of new media, we have at our disposal new educational and intellectual spaces in the shape of multimodal forms of communication, and I take that very seriously. Many of our graduate students have grown up in what we call screen culture. They're digital natives. We need to change. Many of them have grown up working in communities. New modes of undergraduate learning include service learning, community-based learning, and experiential learning. Much work is being done at the undergraduate level that is portfolio-based and project-based. It's often web-based. We need to think about our work in terms of research in those terms as well. Many of our graduate students are restless. They want to connect their scholarship with concerns that are larger than the purely professional. In short, in the midst of the corporization of the university, as well as the contraction of higher education and the crisis in scholarly publishing, and let me just pause for a minute to say something about the crisis in scholarly publishing. It's a crisis of the monograph only, really. It's not a crisis in the humanities in terms of journals. So we need to reconsider the monograph as the most important, and now I'm referring predominantly, of course, to the humanities and not to work in the creative arts. We need to rethink the monograph uh, and the dissertation as a monograph. There's a promising convergence between the goals and modes of scholarship that goes public with the digital humanities. Those two things work together very well, and it offers me a lot of confidence about 
the future of scholarly communication. And here I'm using the word communication, which is much larger than publication. Since our remarks are prelude to further discussions about what shape this humanities center here might take, allow me to be more specific. I speak as the director a long time about, um, it's been quite a long time, of a center for the humanities, although at the Simpson Center at the University of Washington, a full 50% of what we support is work in the social sciences and uh, to a lesser extent in the arts. We've supported many long-range projects over a period of several years, ranging from Asia and Trauma, a very important four-year project, to a six-year project with multiple people involved on the modern girl around the world from the 20s and the 30s. People with different language expertise and cultural expertise contributed to that. We have a very active, active collaboration in science studies that is in its fourth year, and I know Neil knows something about that. And of course, many, many other projects. But I want to say something, and I think it's appropriate given uh, Jeff and our different locations all together, about the different shapes that humanity centers take. An historical note. Over the past five decades, virtually all of the 62 research universities that are members of the Association of American Universities, and that includes, of course, two universities in Canada, almost all of them have created humanities centers, ranging from the Institute for Research in the Humanities that was founded at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1959, to the inauguration just this last fall of a new humanities center at the University of Arizona. The institution of the Humanities Center has proved remarkably supple, forward-looking, resilient, durable, and in great part it's precisely because, unlike most centers, and I see them all around your campus, and institutes, they don't have a particular mission. It's a capacious sphere, if you will, that over time allows what you choose as a general mandate to, in fact, be filled with different kinds of specific projects. Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of centers, and we represent them. I'm going to refer you to a piece by James Chandler in Critical Inquiry that appeared in the summer of 2009. It's a special issue devoted to the fate of the disciplines, uh, but it's not as uh, uh, cataclysmic as it might feel from the title. He delineates, on the one hand, the Institute for Advanced Study, and on the other hand, the Humanities Center. And in brief, this is the distinction he makes, that institutes for advanced study tend to offer havens for scholars to focus on their research away from the demands of everyday life and offer fellowships to individuals. And the Getty, for example, where Neil will be, is one of them, and of course the National Humanities Center also. While humanities centers, as they've evolved over the past four decades, emphasize bringing scholars together in collaborative groups on common projects, and holding high-profile events and informal gatherings for dialogue and discussion. All of them have been key to the support of humanities scholarship across a wide range of departments and disciplines. It has to be very, very capacious. They've been key to sparking and seeding innovative work in the humanities. So what may not be able to be seeded in a department, it can be tried out in a humanities center. It's been key to creating vital networks that offer faculty and graduate students a different intellectual home so that they can have more than one intellectual home, very important. Like an excellent library, humanities centers serve as magnets for recruiting and, if I will say, retaining faculty and increasingly graduate students. I receive a lot of emails from graduate students wanting to know uh, what is the space for collaborative work in the humanities at the University of Washington. Fellowships for individuals have been a staple of both centers, but I want to tell you what the five major trends are that I see at humanities centers uh, around predominantly the country. And you, of course, would uh, choose where you're here is from here. These are just major trends and at humanities centers. First of all, more programs have been created in recent years 
in terms of collaborative research, really collaborative research, not the research by the individual, uh, and teaching. And if there were one word I would use now to say what kinds of work is going on in Humanities Center, I would use the word collaborative and not the word interdisciplinary. And so here we go. Let me see if this will work. Just a few websites, let's see. Oh, that's great. That didn't work. Oh. Well, I said it wouldn't matter. Down. Down. Keep talking. <laughs> oh, how did you do that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, there, there you go. You just press. OK, OK, that, that, all right. Uh, so this is a, sh a screenshot, obviously, of the Hall Center for the Humanities at the University of Kansas, which has just announced a new initiative in collaborative research. Faculty members working together on a common project. I should say that I've also seen, uh-oh, okay. This isn't going to work. Oh, here, maybe I can use this. I don't use a Mac, as you can see. All right. OK. If, if this doesn't start working smoothly, I will simply stop it. <laughs> In terms of collaboration, I've seen the purview of humanity centers consistently widening to, widening to include the professions as well, certainly the social sciences and the arts, but lately I've seen much more work and collaboration done with law, social work, public health, and medicine. And this is from Brown University. One of their major initiatives is in the medical humanities. And, let's see. Oh shoot, the next one's for Gage. I'm not doing this. How? Now see, it goes away, it fades away. It's weird. UBC's weird. Okay, all right, this is for Gage. <laughs> so the uh, John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University has established a wonderful space, and this is a space for teaching because collaborative teaching is more and more being sponsored by humanity centers, as I've seen across the country. This is a lab space that they've created, and in the wake, of course, of the hurricane, um, this lab has been set up, and there's just wonderful, wonderful work going on there, which is very inspiring. If I were establishing a humanity center right now from the ground up, and I realize that this may be or may not be a provocation for you, I would emphasize collaboration, and I would not emphasize individual fellowships for faculty members for working on individual books. I would simply not do it. Remember, we have a crisis in scholarly publishing of the monograph, and yet we continue to support them over and over again. And now I'm just referring to the monograph that is print, bound, and not searchable. We need to make the monograph accessible. Number two, over the past 10 years in particular, many humanities centers have sponsored and focused on public humanities and public scholarship, which you've heard I've been connected with. They've initiated closer ties with uh, their communities and Community engagement is the focus of one of our sessions tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend any time discussing this, but I will say that the programs take many shapes. And one is, for example, at the University of Iowa Oberman Institute, a graduate institute of engagement and the academy, a week-long institute for graduate students on the genealogy of engagement or whatever terms you're using for involvement of the academy with larger or other publics. And then I want to give an example too from the University of Washington and the Simpson Center. Partnerships and collaboration, and this is a community collaboration here, is taking the form of working with other institutions that are completely unlike ours and with very, very different temporalities. One is a radio station where uh, a two-minute capsule of your research is honored as opposed to the 300-page book. And the other is the Experience Music Project, which is a museum and is devoted to 
popular music. These collaborations have been absolutely fascinating and I consider this a form of research that we've been doing. Number three, many humanities centers have been underwriting work in the digital humanities and here is one the, uh, from Cambridge, the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and the Humanities, CRASH, as it's known. They have instituted, uh, some of them are learning opportunities for many of us to see what kinds of other forms our research can take and other forms of dissemination can take for our research. And this is just beginning to uh, appear not spontaneously, but because it's the time at many, many humanities centers. Another one, let, this is general. Uh, here's an example of a project at Irvine at the uh, HRI Humanities Research there, which serves the entire system of the University of California. This is a redlining project that is driven digitally the research that's contributed to it is mapping the areas that have been redlined in California over its history. And this is something that is available to the public, which is very, very important. How can we make our research, and I'm focusing on research predominantly, available to larger publics? One more example. This is uh, an example, actually, of um, the fourth trend, I would say, in humanity centers, which is a concern with public policy. It's emerged as a focus of quite a few centers, with the idea of community being expanded to ever larger spheres, as Gage, you said in um, your opening remarks, including national security, for example, and borders and health and illness. Uh, as I said, this is one of my favorite examples. This is a new institute. It's the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University that was established in 2007. Their mission is, and I think this is very important, it's to bring theoretically serious scholarship to bear on major public issues. As an integral part of that mission, it supports communication and collaboration between researchers that are from the academy and people from the outside. And this project, I think, is wonderful. Cultures of Finance, uh, with one of the organizers being um, the anthropologist Arjun Apaturai. And then as a fifth trend, what I've seen emerging recently are networks of centers engaged in collaborative projects. And uh, this is, I think, one of the very first the Mellon Humanities Corridor, wonderfully entitled Mellon, because of course this is where the funding is coming from, that is triangulated by the three humanities centers, one at Syracuse, one at Rochester, and one at Cornell. And what kinds of projects do they undertake? For example, uh, there are disciplinary projects, linguistics is one of them, so how can they collaborate within that discipline across institutions? Interdisciplinary, it isn't the watchword there. Collaboration is, visual culture is another emphasis. Rochester is very, very strong in visual culture and joint graduate courses are being given at the three universities. Very, very exciting. So those are two examples of the kinds of collaborations that are going on there. And as some of you at lunch know, I myself have a dream of us creating with the anchors of UBC and the University of Washington, a Cascades Humanities Corridor, or shall we call it, what should, should we call it, Pacific, I feel awkward calling it Northwest, because this isn't the Northwest here, <laughs> Cascade Humanities Corridor that would stretch from Vancouver, Victoria, down through Washington and through Oregon. We could do wonderful collaborations. If you put those five trends together, a lot can happen. Let me just say a few words about logistics. This is to say strategies and mechanisms, and I know that we'll have a chance to talk more about this tomorrow, but I do want to ask you to consider five different points. That you consider strategies for integrating the intellectual work of your institute and the intellectual and creative, those have to be the two primary focuses, of course. We do not give up those words. To integrate that work with 
doctoral education. How can you put those together? Also, that you not allow the institute to be viewed, and I don't think this would happen under your current dean, as primarily a potential fundraiser, a machine for writing grants for extramural support to other grant making agencies, and that relates actually to what Jeffrey was saying too. So that's number two. Number three, that from the very beginning, you consider the creation of your institute in tandem with the digital revolution that is radically changing how we undertake and disseminate knowledge and the forms that it take, takes. And that number seven, that you not devote precious resources to a program of postdoctoral fellows if they are funded by your own university, if they're funded by the Mellon Foundation or another wonderful source of support, that would be fine. But I would, uh, I would really suggest that you not do that. Uh, so those are strategies and mechanisms. And most important is the intellectual orientation and the creative orientation of your institute. And as a provocation, again, what I would like to say at this point is that if I were to found a center today, I would take it to have as its capacious purview matters that are of intense concern to a larger public interest. It would be up to you to find ways to cast your research as having that importance. So matters of public in of interest, this can include the history and the future of the book, of course. It can include processes of reading. It can include other kinds of matters such as border issues and indigeneity, translation across cultures, um, culture and the arts in particular as agents of change. I'm thinking of a wonderful initiative here at Harvard under the rubric led by Dora Summer, actually a wonderful scholar in uh, Latin American studies among other things, called Cultural Agents cultural agents. So how you would cast it, it would be up to us or up to you to be able to say, look, this is how my research does matter, and then find ways to put it together with other people. So what might be an example? Let me focus on climate change, and in concluding my remarks, this will let me focus on climate change and what I want to call actually big humanities, and here I am evoking the sciences and big science. At the present moment, what I see looking at humanity centers um, around the world, actually, this is the issue that seems to be engaging most of them. I can point to this, the Baker Nord Center. This is the Baker Nord Center at Case Western Reserve University. I can point to the Illinois Program for Research in the Humanities at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which sponsored this uh, lecture series last year. I can point to, and again, these are just selected. Come on. Come on. The Institute for Collaborative Research in Public Humanities, which I underscore the title of at Ohio State University a project on environmental citizenship, which is not a single year project, and that's another thing that's so important. We need to think in terms of longer temporalities for project and not the year. I can point to, again, CRASH. Oh, actually, this is um, the Townsend Center at Berkeley, and then finally, uh, to crash, which had itself also a cultures of climate change research group. Environmental issues require decisive, strong, and proactive public policies. But making a case, a persuasive case for public policy is undermined, and I think almost fatally so, by the failure of our individual and collective imagination to comprehend the long arc of the history of the human species. And this is where and we heard this before with Jeffrey, this is where the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences can help us stretch our imagination to provide a firm foundation for understanding, one that would be characterized by a commitment, which would be a moral, or, a moral obligation to care for the life on our planet in all senses of the word. Now, what can we offer? And 
I'm sure many of you will know this. I hope you've read his wonderful essay in Critical Inquiry. This is just, a, just an example of work that I see as exceedingly strong research that is based on collaborative research and profoundly communicates with the public audience. You will probably know Dipesh Chakrabarty as a post-colonial scholar from the University of Chicago. Several years ago, he decided to take up the matter of climate change. A year and a half ago, he gave this, what was an exceedingly thought-provoking talk at the University of Washington, and I know he's given it many, many other places, and he should give it everywhere. It was something that we're still talking about. It was a kind of intellectual stimulus package in and of itself. It inspired many of us to widen our frame of thought. It was a completely new departure for him. He became interested in global warming for all of the right reasons, actually. Most importantly, because it's altogether clear to him that this crisis is one of the most important turning points in human history. He's been in conversation with scientists, with policymakers, and engineers. And you see there the collaboration is reaching out beyond the purview of the humanities itself. He's read the work of paleontologists, reports from the United Nations. He's thought deeply about what he calls the climate justice position, which is abbreviated as the West versus the rest. And he understands as an historian the terrible irony by which the economic developments of the last 250 years, those are years, of course, which witnessed the Enlightenment as well as struggles for democracy around the world, but those were also years, modernization and the development of capitalism, which unintentionally, unintentionally caused the crisis of global warming. For him, global warming is the shadow that falls on the promise of civilization and its performance in the last 200 years. For him, and theoretically, this is a very important point, if human agency is at the center of the environmental crisis, then the distinction between natural history and human history has itself collapsed. This is in itself an exciting intervention into historiography. And this leads to what, for my remarks today, was the main problematic of his talk, although I'm greatly simplifying it. And that is the difficulty of being able to comprehend simultaneously such different scales of time. This is something we all need to point our heads to. Geological time that exists on the scale of thousands of years, that's the long part of his title, the long and the short of it. And then on the other hand, the scale of historical time which is, in this case, 250 years. But this difficulty is further compounded by the fact that as human beings, we're focused on the present and seem only to be able to think backwards in two generations or forwards in two generations. And you see that yourselves. I mean, we all see this in terms of public policy when public policy, say, has a 10-year time frame. We'll implement this for 10 years. Or we'll implement this tax increase for, or tax reduction for three years or four years. The pressing question is, for him, how do we bring into the fold of our imagination a future that's so distant with generation upon generation upon generation threatened by our past actions and by what we will do in the near future? How can we imagine what we seem constitutionally unable to imagine? How can we come to care to feel forcefully and not just cognitively that we are making a decisive, not to say catastrophic difference of geological proportions. His talk engaged subtle differences of historiography, of differing views of human beings, underpinning different strands of thought, of cultural memory. What is so important is that he didn't offer any practical uh, solutions or suggestions to the problem. What he did was open up a space for thought that was charged and impelled some people to think further with him. 
he did precisely what I think many of us in the humanities feel it is our mission to do, which is to create large frames of reference, but also to look closely at individual cases and to create spaces for thought and occasion for feeling. And in that space that he was in, he did just that. So we have doctors without borders. We need scholars without borders. I differ here with Jeffrey. Uh, without disciplinary borders, without professional borders, without national borders. And um, for me, it was exemplified in this talk that Devesh Chakrabarty gave. We need to encourage collaborative and creative, collective intellectual work. We need to, not just studies, but stories that speak to our possible futures, that move us beyond stereotypes and introduce us to nuances and subtlety. We need more than what I call soundbite stories. I'm not interested in uh, us just giving media soundbites to the press. We need to be able to engage matters of public policy on imaginative, conceptual, moral, comic, and aesthetic levels. We need more than an avalanche of numbers that dominate public policy, because the numbers don't allow us to imagine in any thoughtful or textured way our way into the future. We need to be cross-medium scholars, thinking not just outside the box, but outside the book. That is to say, that non-searchable book that exists only in libraries. We need to publish our work in journals, but we also need to find ways to work in the new media, including multimodal media, multimodal media for our work. And this is where I come to the dissertation. And I just want to mention to you one thing that is being undertaken right now by the Modern Language Association under its past president, Sidney Smith, professor of English at the University of Michigan. There is a survey that has gone out to doctoral programs, heads of doctoral programs around the country just last week that asks what kinds of dissertations does your department, does your department envision and have you considered or are you considering these other forms of dissertation? And here they are, collaborative project, creative nonfiction, fiction or poetry, Digital project, ensemble of forms or portfolio, monograph, monograph, one, one of the choices, suite of essay, translation, et cetera. I'm interested to see how the survey will come back. I think in and of itself, this particular survey is a very, very important, very important intervention as we move into new forms of scholarly communication. Uh, so let me just mention in terms of um, conclusion, I mentioned before that one of the emerging trends in humanity centers around the world is a focus on networks as well as another trend as a focus on climate change as an interest. And the Consortium of Humanity Centers and Institutes, which numbers some 150 centers around the world, is having as its conference in 2012, a conference on the matter of climate change and the environment. And what I'm hoping is um, that you will be at that conference with your new institute. Thanks very much. I, and I should point out earlier in my remarks, I, I mentioned the kinds of um, units at this institution and initiatives at UBC that we might want to think about as we design um, the work that we'd like to do and the, um, and the uh, units that would guide that. One of those is, is on the drawing board, and I bring it up because of your, your comments, Kathleen, and that's the School for Public Policy at UBC. This is a, um, a significant initiative of our president. Uh, I believe something like this uh, will take shape over the next few years here. Um, and and as, as it happens, one of the issues I've raised is whether or not we would have something that would look at cultural policy, humanities uh, in relationship, uh, so that it doesn't become a um, redoubt simply of, of the social sciences, um, law, etc. 
So consider that as well uh, as, a, um, as something on the horizon. We'd like to open this up now for a, con a discussion and conversation. Um, you can ask questions of our panelists, I guess. We're not really a panel, but our, <laughs> our, um, our uh, speakers today. And, uh, and also make comments um, and uh, engage for the next however many minutes we have. Yeah. We'll look at We have an hour, so we'll... Great. Or comments, questions. Um, I think that you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your talk that uh, the percentage of higher education is now predominant or ever more surprising to the public. So I assume you mean as well that the perception of humanity is also uh, as a private. Did everyone, Did everyone hear that question? No. Okay. Uh, I, we could repeat them as up here, or you could come, also come to the mic if you prefer. Um, uh, Danny's question was that um, uh, we've discussed the, uh, the university, uh, as it is understood increasingly as a private good. Is that true of the humanities as well? And the reason I ask that is because there must be people who believe that it should be a private good or what we have. And I'm curious about why they think that. I don't. It's a really, really good question that you ask. And what I see is that the humanities might not even be part of the question. So when parents are asked, for example, why, um, what do you think your kids should get out of going to college? It's that sort of data-driven survey. And they say, well, we need our kid to get a good job. We, so it's driven by, you will make more money if you graduate from college. And given the enrollments, you know that enrollments in business, enrollments in the professional schools have gone up. I mean, Bill Redding's, uh, contributed so much to this discussion in, was it 1995 that book was published? So it's very tricky, this relationship between the public and the private. Understanding it as a private good is as a consumer good, or as an investment, the two together. How many humanity centers are funded by state funding? How many are funded by private endowments? I actually can't. Uh, answer that question with any kind of specificity. I know every humanities center <laughs> strives for an endowment. Why is the one I'm at called the Simpson Center for the Humanities? Because it was uh, gifted with a $5 million initial endowment. So I can't answer that, but we certainly strive for that. We have also, though, at, and don't tell anyone, I don't tell them, and I, I know that sounds like I'm being coy, but really, I don't tell people. We do have $500,000 in a budget line from the state, in addition to an endowment that is beginning to reach um, a $10 million level, which is the bare minimum. Gage. <laughs> I, I should also note that I was speaking with your um, Associate Dean for Humanities in the Faculty of Arts and Science uh, just about a month and a half ago, and uh, he was discussing the decline in state um, contributions to the university from, it had been something over 50% at one point, uh, and uh, they're looking at a, possibly a, a, a landing place of about 5%. 5% contribution from them. at the University of Washington, 5% of our total budget coming from the state. That's, that's an eye opener, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So, building on that question, then how does one change the public perception of the university as a job training? Well, I should allow you to, you know, speak. <laughs> I try to do this every day. We try to encourage everybody to do this. When I first came to the University of Washington, the very phrase public scholarship was something that was um, unknown. We now have a whole group of faculty members who do all kinds of things, uh, including publishing things for larger audiences. They never would have done this before. Um, the whole op-eds, let me give one specific example. And maybe it's not a good example, but I love it, so I hope you'll um, allow me to do so. 
a wonderful research project done by one of our historians named Jim Gregory under the title, actually I wrote about this in the article in Daedalus, under the title of Seattle um, Civil Rights and Labor History. We have the largest archive, by the way, of Black Panther materials in Seattle, anywhere in the world. And this was something that he created with students, with faculty and graduate students. And the ripple effect has been incredible. He has now been invited, along with the graduate students involved, to come down and consult with people in our city government about race relations. So moving into the city, this has changed, this has changed things. Now at another level, we've developed a curriculum at the graduate level that's in public scholarship. And hopefully there will be a ripple effect too. But it sounds like an answer to your answer to Danny's question, that this is absolutely not that, but it's not. It's, I mean, how effective is it, given your answer to Danny, where the statement of parents is, we need our children to make money from the leaders? I know, I guess um, I have to give both answers, that within the large frame, of course, it's an uphill it is an uphill battle. I don't even know if it's uphill, it's just like stratospheric. <laughs> Where is it located? I mean, structurally, um, I can't change conditions within entire nation states, etc. But I do see, <laughs> I do see change taking place on my campus. I absolutely see it. It's a different ethos, at least within